So once again, you are welcome, but I want you to prepare the slides and, and, and go through these slides on your own, especially the graph. There's one graph called 2D box plot, okay? You use a bag plot function called APL pack in R to do that, okay? And using that same data set, you can go through this. I want you to go through these things on your own. So I'm not gonna show you much through how to generate the back plots on your own, feel the rhythm on how to do that. That's a 2D back plot. And then scatter plot matrices, okay? Go through the commands that I've given there to showcase a scatter plot matrix. When we come to regression, I'll be showing you scatter plot matrix. Um, and there's a typical example of a scatter This is the MPG, the displacement, the drought and the weight. And the scatter plot matrix tries to show the relationship between each one. So if you want to read the relationship between MPG and that of weight, all you have to do is a move weight on the left and then bring the MPG down where they meet. That's where you read the story. And when you look at the way the graph is plotted, the scatter plot is made, you can see that just between MPG and weight, there is a negative relationship. There is an just looking at the graph. Okay. When you look at the graph between weight and displacement, what would you say is a relationship? Between weight and displacement, what would you say is a relationship? Who can tell me? Okay. Raise your hand. Between weight and displacement, what would you say is a relation? Gilbert. Okay. Yeah, I would say it's also uh, negative. Okay. No, it is not negative. Okay, between weight and displacement, what is the relationship? It's not negative. Prince. It's a positive. Prince. So it's positive. It's a positive relationship. It's a positive relationship. Something aside, Prince. I called Prince, and then three people are talking. So there is a positive relationship between. You guys, please try and be professional, okay? If I haven't called you and you start talking, you interrupt the person who is talking and the sound becomes bad. Yeah, Prince, I got you is positive because this is where the relationship is shown. So that is positive, okay? All right. So let me talk about the last one, displacement and MPG. What is the relationship between displacement and MPG? Maxwell. Dog is negatively related. It's negative, that's correct. So you should be able to use scatter plot matrix helps you to look at this. Okay. This is another way of looking at scatter plot matrix. It's uh, for the All of these commands are there. There is a, a 3D scatter plot that you can do. Okay? There's a 3D scatter plot that you can do. This is a typical example of a 3D scatter plot. So I want to scatter plot the relationship between MPG, weight, and displacement. And if you look at it carefully, you see that I see the scatter plots are hanging in the air. So there's a typical 3D, and the commands here will do that for you. Okay. The commands called scatterplot 3D will do that interesting thing for you. There's another one you can do, scatterplot 3D. You can even bring a fitted line to it. So this is a scatterplot 3D, this time with a fitted line with some colors. Okay. You can see here that I have library scatterplot. I've attached the data. When you attach the data, what it means is that you don't have to add dollar symbols. And this plus 3D show the pitch is 16. Okay, the position they highlight it. Okay, and then you've indicated that 3D is true, which means you want it to be a 3D. And then you give the title 3D scatter plot. And then you write the fitted line. So this fitted line will show the fitted line, and the S, uh, the 3D plane will now showcase this. So this is a typical example of a, a fitted line. Okay. 
for the fertilizer. You see how a little bit co confusing it might look like. So that's like um, a polyhedra. And so it's not, that's why we normally don't use 3Ds, three variable cases. We only talk about two cases, X and Y. We are showing regression. And you can have one where you can spin. So this command, this blue command, RGL, gives you one that you can spin. So this one, if I had done it in R, I can spin it, and I did it in R. If it was live, you see me spinning it, and it's turning around left, right, center, in any way that you can. Yeah. These are all the complex kinds of graphs. And then you can combine all graphs together, like this. Okay? So you can combine the MPG with weight, MPG with displacement, okay? histogram, um, box plot, all of them, you can put them together using that command that I just showed you. Go try your hands on all of this. Okay? It's the best way to master how. And then finally, you can have a 3D example where you show the names as well. So this is miles per gallon, this is weight, this is displacement, and this time you're showing the names inside the graph. This is just to tell you how powerful R is. In doing so many incredible things. You can have a 3D surface. We use this a lot when we are dealing with um, kernel density estimations and surface plots. Okay? To know the depth of the density in a 3D format. All of this showed up. Now let me tell you your exams. I'm going to share your exams with you so that you use the next two and a half months to prepare. If not three months, yeah, two and a half months to prepare. Consider two papers or one paper that use any of the techniques we will learn in this course, like hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, ANOVA, regression, different kinds of regression, whether it's panel, limited dependent variable regression, time series regression, okay, panel data econometrics. We are going to do all of these and factor analysis and all of that. So you pick a paper that is using two of the techniques. If you can't get one paper using two techniques, then you must get two papers using one, one each of the techniques. What are you supposed to do? Criticize the paper, criticize the methodology. Now, in order to provide a good critique, first you need to look at the approach taken, whether the approach, the method meets the aims how the data was sourced, what problems was encountered in collecting the data. Okay, the author has indicated that how these were handled. Indicate any problems with analysis, what conclusions it legitimately enables one to draw, how this may differ from conclusions made by previous or other authors afterwards. If you ref reference, uh, if you have any published work that you you check, reference them, okay, you should reference them. Don't reference papers that have read, don't cite references that this very paper has cited. So if you are taking paper A and paper A has cited Adam Smith, you don't have to cite Adam Smith. Credit will not be given for synopsis or presale of the paper or repeating any limitations or failings the paper has indicated, no. Don't summarize the paper for me, don't. In any case, get the papers approved by me before you choose the paper. Now, what I have done is that I have selected five main papers that cut across the disciplines that we have here in this course. It cuts across marketing, HR, health services, operations research, operations and MIS, accounting, finance, and all of the five different papers are cut across. So you can get a paper from that. And you will now summarize that paper and then critique, okay? It should not take more than five pages. When you are getting it more than five pages, then you have This is inclusive of everything, diagrams, graphs, and um, references, everything. This is the paper 
that I want to. So you, is, you're going to criticize the methodological ambience of the paper. So if a paper is using ANOVA, you realize that they should have used regression instead of using ANOVA. They should have done non-parametric statistical test instead of doing parametric stuff. You got to now criticize the papers, but you can better do that if you follow this whole course. That is when you can do that. You will submit this paper on the day of your exams for this paper. So if your exam is gonna be organized on the 13th of March, that is the day you will submit the paper. You submit it through Sakai, a Tenetan will run Tenetan report against plagiarism. And you also hand deliver the hard copy to the office. As time goes on, we'll be talking more about this. Okay, so don't worry at all. Ladies and gentlemen, today we want to start hypothesis testing. And I'll be a bit fast, so you got to be with me. And the reason why I'll be a bit fast is that I've given you the data already. So my advice is that whilst I'm about to walk you through the basics, open your data set that I sent to you data set, open it, and at the same time also um, open your R. Open your R and open your data set. All right, so I want to first tell you the steps in hypothesis testing. It's a very simple thing. Formulate the null and the alternative hypothesis. A hypothesis is a, a statement, a generalized statement that you make. The null hypothesis is said to be true until it's proven otherwise. And the otherwise is from research data, information gathered, and then you use that information to reject the null. The whole idea in hypothesis testing generally is to reject a null hypothesis unless otherwise stated. But you can't reject a null hypothesis. A typical example of a null hypothesis could be um, NDC won the last election. NDC won the election. That's a, that's a hypothesis. But this hypothesis must normally be set by the Electoral Commission. So what did the Electoral Commission say? MPP won the election. Now, this is a hypothesis. Okay, It's a hypothesis. But normally, the hypothesis must come from an authority. And the Electoral Commission is an authority. Now, somebody wants to debunk that hypothesis. So you can see that you know, I said you can turn the rest of gathered information, which is fantastic because that is what the alternative is. The alternative is to gather hypo uh, information and then carry out an analysis and do create what is known as uh, information and then come out with a, a statistic. And you'll be learning a lot of the new statistics along the line. So you have a statistic which is there already, existing statistic. And a statistic can be a Z statistic. T statistic, F statistic, you know, U statistic, H statistic, W statistic, um, W statistic, um, um, chi square statistic, and several others. So you need that statistic and compare that statistic with a critical value and that will come out with a solution. Now, let me, let me tell you something very quickly. The statistic will always be given to you by the software. And in some cases, the critical value will also be given to you. Now, from the statistic, from the test statistic, you can get a p-value. From the test statistic, you can get a p-value. What is the p-value? Well, you need the p-value because you need to compare the p-value with alpha, which is a level of significance. Now, the p-value is said to be different from the alpha. Okay. Alpha. Now, alpha is a level of significance. That's the alpha. It's a level of significance. Now, there are three main different kinds of alpha. 1%, 5%, 10%. What is alpha? Alpha is expected error. It's an expected mistake you are likely to make in a statistical analysis. So you are carrying out a research, you are making some analysis, you are allowed to make some mistakes. You are allowed to make some mistakes. The mistake you are allowed to make can be 1% mistake you are allowed to make, 5% mistakes you are allowed to make, 10% mistakes you are allowed to make. But you see, the mistake you are expected to make is different from the mistake you actually make. 
The mistake you actually make is known as the p-value. So the p-value is the actual mistake that you make. Now within these two, which one would you expect that it must be smaller for you to be happy? Is it a p-value or the alpha? Who can tell me? Which one must be smaller? The p-value or the alpha? David. The p-value. David. P-value, please. Yes, it's the, the p-value. P-value. Why? Because that is the actual mistake. So if the actual mistake is, is smaller, it means that your analysis uh, may be right or the results may be accept, acceptable. Good. But if the, if the error is bigger, then your methodology or your analysis may be questioned. Thank you. So if, if the actual mistake, you see, what it means is that if, you, if your actual mistake is smaller, it means you have enough gravitas to reject the null hypothesis. That's what it means. You have enough gravitas to reject the null hypothesis. You have a lot of confidence. And that is why one, pers- one minus the level of alpha is the, is the confidence interval. Because once you have a smaller p-value, your confidence level rises. And you have enough, enough, enough guts to be able to reject the null hypothesis. And so the p-value is a very significant you know, area that one has to go through. So the p-value is an important, important thing. And you would always want a smaller p-value to be able to, okay, of course, in the context, because in some non-parametric situations, you would want the p-value rather to be bigger. Okay. But in most parametric situations, I'll talk about parametric and non-parametric pretty soon. So, Take note, your p-value is an important thing. So once you have the statistic, you can generate the p-value from it. And then you compare. If the p-value is smaller, as you can see on your screen, then you can conclude statistically and practically that you are able to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, what are the tests that can be used? There are different kinds of tests. I mentioned quite a number of them. One of one group of tests are known as parametric tests. Parametric tests assume that the data is normally distributed. What is a normally distributed data? A normally distributed data is that sort of data which is, the last time we looked at it, is that kind of a data where majority of the data points are around a particular number. In this case, it can be the average. And the average can be the mean, the median, or the mode. When majority of the data points are around the average, okay, then we are talking about a normally distributed. And most things in life are generally normally distributed. For example, our ages here are normally distributed. Majority are around a certain age. Our salaries are normally distributed. Because majority of us here are earning between 3,000 and 6,000. If I should say that, let me see by hands, those who are earning between 3,000 and 6,000, which means that the average of, of people around here is around 4,005. If I should ask, it's going to be the same number around that. And that is a normally distributed. The opposite is a non-parametric test, which is used for non-normally distributed data. Edward, your hand is up. Bro, um, I want to understand this clearly. So you said the normally distributed is where the set of data are around a particular number. I, I thought it's around the average. I didn't say particular so, number. I say around the average. And I gave an example of an average. Oh, OK. OK, all right. Thank you. All right. So. Non-parametric data is used for most statistics, most data set that are skewed. And most data set that are skewed are data that are usually ordinal, you know, like data where you rank them, ranking data. They are usually non-parametric or data that have outliers, but not influences. 
data that are truncated, data that are Tobit related, logit related, probit related, censored related. Okay? They are imprecise data. Okay? When you have those kind of data, and you will come across some of them in your time. I don't have to give you too many examples. A, a typical example of such kind of data are data that are in percentages. Okay? Most things that are in percentages, they are non-parametric in nature. And so when you have that kind of data, the likelihood of you using a non-parametric test is high. Now let's look at tests that are parametric and those that are not non-parametric. Okay. Those that are parametric and those that are not parametric. So the table on your screen gives examples of parametric tests. I guarantee you, you will use one of these along the line in your research. You will use it. One sample t-test. When you have a single sample and then you want to really check certain things, you can use a one sample t-test. The opposite is a, a, a binomial or a non-parametric one sample equivalent. The t-test, there are different kinds of them, the t-test. Okay, you have the ones that are paired and the ones that are not paired. We shall look at them now. And that is for two samples, two samples. Its non-parametric versions are Wokoxen, Manwitni, Magnima, okay, and all of that. That is for two samples. Then when you get into the world of correlations and ANOVA, whether it is repeated or unrepeated, independent or dependent ANOVA, that is when you are going into three or more samples. So let's say you have foreign banks, they are return on asset. Domestic bank, they are return on asset. State banks, they are return on asset. And you want to check whether there's a significant difference in the return on asset. Is there a significant, which one? Okay, I'll give you a typical example. I like giving examples because examples are more efficacious than presets. Okay, let me just give you a couple of examples. Let's say you have the return on asset for state banks. Okay, the return on asset for private domestic banks and the return on assets for foreign banks. And these banks are all listed here. Okay. Let's say the return on asset for these guys are 50,000, 56,000, 57,000, 21,000. Okay. And for private domestic, okay, you have 70,000, you have 10,000, 16,000, 20,000, 30,000. You can see that the sample is not balanced. Okay. And for foreign banks, you have, you know, 20,000, 60,000, 30,000, 44,000. Okay. So you have, you have different groups and you calculate the mean. I don't want to calculate the mean, but let's say you calculate the mean. And then you had the mean for the first one to be say 40. The mean for the second one, you got it to be 45. The mean for the third one, you got it to be um, say 38. Now, the likelihood is that you might likely say that, I mean, somebody who is not rich search oriented might likely say that this one is showing the highest mean. The highest mean. But that is not the truth. That is not showing the highest mean. Okay? Because you can't say that statistically speaking, unless you have done a statistical thing, unless you've subjected the whole thing to a statistical torture. So, how do you do that? This is where you bring, because the samples are three, these are three different samples. This is where you bring something known as ANOVA if the data is normally distributed. If it is not, if the data is not normally distributed, you bring something that is known as Kruskawales or Friedman. Okay, and we shall do all of this. So you are now able to make an assumption and it will tell you that there's a significant difference in the means across all three groups. It will even tell you that there's no significant, even though the gap between 40 and 45 and 38, okay, even though it appears there's a gap, statistical analysis can come back and tell you that there is no significant difference in the means. No significant difference. And that whatever difference you see, which is between this and that, whatever difference you see here, which is five, and whatever difference you see here, you know, which is about three, these differences are which is about eight, okay? These differences are just due to chance. They are just 
you know, by virtue of random chances. And so statistical analysis will come and tell you properly whether, yeah, there's a difference. There's, there's a difference. There's a difference of five years. There's a difference of eight years. But is this significant enough to warrant the fact that domestic banks are outperforming the state or the foreign? Okay. Statistical. So you need a statistical backing. And that is why statistical hypothesis testing are very, very important. So when the data is more than three or three or more, you use ANOVA, which is for parametric or you use its non-parametric equivalent. Now, so let me summarize these tests before we start looking at some example. The first thing in any of your research you would do, either for this course or for your normal research, is to select which test you're going to deal with. Check whether you're going to use parametric test or non-parametric test. You got to select that immediately ahead of time. How do you do that? One way you can know whether to use parametric or non-parametric is to check the literature. What your colleagues in the area have done. That will tell you, okay? Because there are so many papers I've seen and you see most of them in the ones I'll give you. That people are using non-parametric tests and yet they are not supposed to use that. People are using parametric tests when they are not supposed to use that particular parametric test. Rather, they are supposed to use its non-parametric equivalent. Okay. You got to use a non-parametric analog and not the parametric one. So how, how do you determine that? How do you determine that? Well, we've already established that check normality. Because when you check whether the data is normally distributed or not, once you know that the data is homogeneous, okay, or there's homogeneity or normal distribution, then you cannot go ahead and use what? Parametric. But if the data is non normally distributed, it's skewed, then you should know that you're towards non-parametric you know, test. Second, check if the sample is dependent or independent. Now, the sample that I just gave you, okay, the sample that I just gave you here, is it dependent or independent? Looking at the way I looked at it, who can tell me? The sample that I just gave you, is it dependent or independent? Who can tell me? Is the sample dependent Theodora or independent? Um, I think it's independent. Explain. Because um, the return on assets for each of these firms does not depend on how well the other firm is doing. Okay. Your, your, your choice is good, but your explanation needs further explanation. You can expand it well. Who can expand it all? Okay. Reason why it is independent. Well, it's a sample we are talking about. And the sample, if you look at the sample, they are from different groups. That's all. The samples are from different groups. Okay. But let's assume, suppose I take this sample. Suppose I take um, lecturers. Okay. Suppose I take some lecturers. Lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, lecture four, lecture five. And then I look at these lecturers, um, they are what they did in their MBA, the marks they got mm -hmm. in their MBA or masters. And this one got 50%, this one got 44%, this one got 80%, okay, blah, 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 blah. And then I look at their PhD marks that they had. And this one got 20%, this one got 15%. And then, you know, it continues and on and on and on like that. Now, is this sample dependent or independent and why? Is this sample dependent or independent and why, Grace? It is dependent because you are looking at it from the same group of people. From the same group of people. Exactly. So it's the same person who has been repeated. So the focus is on the sample. You see, the focus is on the sample. This is a sample. And this sample is coming from the same subject. That's the way. The sample is from the same subject. The sample is from the same subject that is dependent. If the sample are from different subjects, it's independent. Finished. Okay. So you got to determine that. Second. 
Then you find the most appropriate test or most parametric test. If the p value is less, you reject the null hypothesis okay, in favor of. Now we are going to look at one, and the first one we're going to look at is independent t test. T tests which are independent. Now, in this context, the y is numeric, that is, the sample is numeric, but the x's are binary. Okay. The x's are binary, in other words, they are categorical variables. So, let's take a typical example. First thing to do is that we're going to check the data. Remember our MPG data. Okay, some hands are up. Some hands that are up. Do you have a question, Maxwell? Yes, Doug. Mm -hmm. Doug, I wanted to find out whether the um, independent and dependent would be based on test or just looking at it. Just looking at it and with knowledge. OK. Uh, I just gave you an example. So when you get another example, you will notice. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. Just note that most, most before and after, most before and after, they are dependent. They are paired. They are matched before and after. It's the same person. You know, if it is countries, it's the same country. So one country, you are checking their GDP. You are checking the, um, the inflation. You are checking the exchange rate. The same country. Okay? So GDP, no, it's, it's, it's dependent. But when you take the GDP of African countries, then you take the GDP of European countries, then GDP of American countries. Now, in this case, the sample is independent because they are different, different groups. Abdul Karim. Karim. All right, let's move on. So, let's Hello. Yeah, I think I had a challenge. Yeah, Doc, we have mentioned so far two uh, criteria to know whether to use the parametric or non-parametric test, the normality of the data and whether it is dependent or independent, the sample. Uh, Doc, uh, my question is, is, the, uh, is there a situation where a, a, a data is normal, like the distribution? It follows a normal distribution. However, the, the sample is independent because uh, I'm asking this because when you say that when the data is normally distributed, we say we, we are going to use the parametric test. But then that is looking at it from the point of view of data. But then when we look at it from the point of view of the sample, can it be that the, the sample would then- The data is the same as the sample. Okay, so all what I'm saying is are the normality and the dependence mutually exclusive in the sense that once you have the data that is normally distributed, it cannot be dependent or independent. That's what it, I, it can. I, I want to understand. And normally distributed data can be both dependent and independent. You check the graph, I mean, check the, check the information I gave you and you see that the answer to that question is already, if you check, this parametric and non-parametric. Okay. You see that some of them here are dependent, independent. Okay. You have independent, you have dependent. Okay. For example, this one, I call it matched. It's the same thing, D-E-P-T, it's dependent. Okay. It's dependent. Now, we have independent teachers, we have dependent teachers. All of them are under parametric. All of them are normally distributed. Okay. And then when you go to non-parametric, Wilcoxon sign rank. It is dependent, Man Whitney is independent, and they are all two sample, two sample. You just need some time to sit down, okay? And you will know that whether it's dependent or independent doesn't depend on whether it's normally distributed. Okay. Once you are normally distributed, you every normally distributed data or every non-normally distributed data will always have one dependent test and one independent test. That's what you should note. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. What was I going to say? So we're going to take the data called empty cars. Do you remember our empty cars data? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So you're going to open your R 
So we are going to be dealing with that empty cars data. Going to deal with that empty cars data. If you have forgotten, okay, just go to our, let me just show you. Most of you type that information. So let's go to this R and then now look on my screen. At the top there, you see library car. That was the first thing we typed. Just type that and run it. You know how to run it. Library car and run it. And then you type MT cars, which is what I just did. And when you look down in my console, I have my information there. When you have that data, empty cars, you look at the data. The first one is MPG, miles per gallon, cylinder, displacement, horsepower, drive, weight, sec, okay, vertical speed, which is a dummy variable, or which is a category. AM is that whether the car is automatic or manual. Okay, whether it's automatic or manual. That one is the gearbox. Okay, what I say, four gear three gearbox and then all of that. And then carburetor, whether it's four or one. All of those last four, they are all um, categorical variables. Sometimes if you want a bit of information about that very data, you can type a question mark and type question mark and empty cars. I just did question mark and empty cars. And on the right, on the right of the bottom right of the page, there's a whole box which is displaying all the information I need about the data. And you have the data was extracted from 1974, Moto Trend, US Magazine. Okay. And then the, everything about the data is shown there. So if you look at AM, AM is zero if the car is automatic, and it's one if the car is manual. One if it's manual, zero if it's automatic. So I want to believe that all of you have the, the, the data. Okay. If you have the data, I want to proceed. Okay. I want to proceed. Okay. So now, with that data now loaded, we are going to check if there is a significant difference between MPG, automatic and manual cars. Now, here's the thing. Someone can say that automatic cars may have a a higher miles per gallon. And we are going to check, okay? we're going to group the MPG according to the whether it's automatic or manual. And then we check whether the MPG is higher for automatic cars and lower for manual cars. That's all. We are checking whether there's a significant difference. Now, the question we need to do is that first thing, we need to determine whether MPG is normally distributed. That's what we need to do first. Is MPG normally distributed? Okay. And then you can see that this data information, automatic and manual, would you say it is dependent sample or independent? Is it, is it matched or unmatched? Is it paired or unpaired? Who can tell me that first? Automatic and manual. Is it dependent, Gabriel? Um, doc, it is independent. It's independent, that's it. Okay. Yes. It's independent when you look at the data, that's it. So what we want to do is this. We want to ensure that the distribution of the response variable, MPG, is normal. Now, this is not new, because we've tried that before. Let's go to our R. Let's go to our R, okay, and check for the normality. Now, we have this thing there. Watch the one I've highlighted. Shapiro.test MPG. We've done it before, but I want to do it again for a reason. So you go to where you type your Shapiro.test MPG. I ran it. Okay, it didn't show because I've not actually indicated some few things. Okay. So one of the first things you might want to do is to run your attach the data. And I've not attached the data. So my number seven here, I will attach the data first. The data is attached. So you come back and come and run your Shapiro.test. And it says the p-value is 0 0.048, so 0 0.05. Okay. 
So on the basis of that, we can say that the data appears to be normally distributed. Now, what do you see at the bottom? What do you see? Oh, sorry, what I did was for horsepower. Let me do for MPG, MPG. So this is Shapiro Wilk Normality Test. And you can see, Martin, your hand is up. Sorry, Doc, I was trying to draw attention to the same thing you just mentioned. So let's go on, All right. sorry. Okay. So if you can see, okay, you can see that the p-value is almost 12%. Yeah. You say that for normality, when the p-value is more than 5%, what does that mean? It means the data is normal, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So we can say that NPG is normally distributed. So that's the first thing to check, the normality of the data in question. Okay. Now, the second thing you can... So unless anybody has a question, you raise your hand. And then I'm going to the next thing. The next thing is you can do a box plot because you're going to compare two things, automatic, manual. So you can do a box plot to see the difference. And this is just a, a picturesque analysis. That's the second thing you can do. But first, this is our normality test. Okay? This is exactly what we said. We attach the data, we do the test, and this is what we had and we can conclude that the data is normally distributed. Now, let's go and do our box plot. Use this command, type this command into the search and tell us, how do you see? Please ignore this one. When you are typing, this is a heading. Okay, so you can ignore the heading. You can ignore the heading and just PG automatic manual. Then you label the exercises as number of automatic manual. You label the y axis as miles per gallon. Miles per gallon. I'm going to identify about two people who will do it, and then I'll give them the chance to show us their screen. So do that. If you try to cut or you you take some time. So I'm taking this thing to my R and then I'm gonna run the analysis. All right. I'm going to do the R analysis. So let me show you my screen. So this is the information I've typed here. If you are typing it, you take time. If you are not typing it. My advice when you get a slice, always type the blue commands before you come. So I'm gonna run this thing, which is what you see, and then run it and then show the results. That's what I've done. And you can see the results on the right, crunching. Manjay. Doc, yeah, I had I've, I've finished running it. That's why I raised my hand. Okay. All right. So let me allow some of you to show your. So, Raphael, I see your work done. Okay. Zero is representing manual, one is represented automatic. So when you look at a black line, in the middle of the blue box plot. That is indicative of the mean. That is indicating the mean. So you can see that the mean is, is actually very nicely shaped for the manual, the zero. Okay. But when you look at the automatic, the mean, which is a black line, is moving towards the, the, the 25th percentile. The 25th percentile is the, the, the bottom of the blue line, the bottom of the box, okay? The upper part is the 75th percentile and the lower part is the 25th percentile. Okay? And when you check it towards the y-axis, you will see that the mean for the manual, 
which is the zero. The mean is towards a number that is, please all of you should lower your hands so that I know those who want to ask a question. Uh, the mean is towards 18 there about. Whereas the number one for the automatic, the mean is towards 22. 22. Yes, Akute, what's your question? No question. His hand is up. Tosa, what's your question? Tosa, what's your question? Yeah, no, no, it wasn't a question. Just to show that I've also done it fine. Prince, what's your question? So I think the my question is that I think I stand to be corrected though, but I think the black line represent the median, but not the mean. So the black line is the median, which represent the 50th percentile. But I don't know, you mentioned as mean. So I just want to draw your attention to that. Okay, 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 okay. All right. So yes, it's the median. Okay. Um Tosa, is your hand still up? It looks like you still have a question again and again. Tosa, your hand is still up all the time. Okay, so from now, I'll assume to ignore you all the time, okay? All right, so that is it. And then you can see the outliers at the end there, you can see the bottom there of the entire data set. Those that are outside the data show. So this is the information that you have. And again, we just want to know whether there is a difference. That's all, whether there is a difference, a significant difference. And what does that tell you just from the top of your head? Would you say there, is a, there seems to be a difference between the manual and automatic cars, as well as MPG is concerned, or there appear to be no difference? What would you say? Would you say there appear to be a difference or there appear to be no difference? Yes, Prince. Uh, so I think with my best eye view, I would say it appears there's difference. But before I can conclude, then I have to do further tests to uh, of course. conclude. Of course, that's where we are coming to. So just yeah, so hindsight, graphical hindsight, it appears that there is some difference there. Okay. One, let me tell you some of the potential differences that it appears. It appears that the median number, okay, if you check the median number, it appears that the median numbers are different. Okay. Well, one is towards 18, one is towards 23. Second, you can see that the boxes are different in terms of the upper in the 25th and the 75th percentile, you can see that they are different. Okay, one expands and the other does not. Okay, and then thirdly, you can see that one is almost all of it is on top of the other. Okay, so there appears to be a difference, but you need a statistical backing, and that is why you go to our next line of action, which is um, what do you call it? Our next line of action, which is the actual test. Okay. Now, if you look at the box plot, you see that. The manual cars, um, okay, I need to just confirm that and you can see that there was no outliers. Yes. There was no outliers in that. If there was an outlier, you see a star after the line, the last line, okay. Yeah. Let's go and do the test now and see whether a significant difference exists. This is, um, oh, another thing is that you can do a kernel density estimation. You can do this on your own. I don't want to do this with you, but you can do this on your own as far as kernel density estimation is concerned. Use this information and do the kernel density estimation, which is this. Okay. So zero is automatic. Okay, I think I need to be sure of that. Zero is automatic, one is manual. Okay, zero is automatic, one is manual. And so if you look at the kernel density plot for manual, okay, and then the kernel density plot for automatic, you will see that the one for automatic, okay, it seems to be normally distributed, okay, and it is highly dense than the one for manual. Of course, these are just picture. It's just another way of looking at the distribution data set aside there, the box plot that we did. So let's go ahead and do the test. There's a test. It's a very simple test that you do. You type t dot test mpg, you know, with a tilde sign. Okay, this sign is called tilde sign and automatic manual. Okay. So let's run that test. 
in your R. So this is an R. Let's run that test. And the results is showing down here. The test is a W test. Sometimes I told you that some of the tests are T test, Z test, I test, Z test, W test. This is a Welsh two sample test, W test. The test statistic here is T, okay? And it is negative. So that means that most of the information you are gonna read the actual um, uh, mean is on the left side of the normal distribution. Other than that, the T statistic is, we always take the absolute value. So that is three point. In fact, when you are writing a journal paper, you will write this T statistic, the degrees of freedom and the P value. That's what you write. What I'm showing you here is what you write. That's what you write. This is what you put in the bracket for the examiner or for the academic reader. And then, now let's look at the p-value. Looking at the p-value, you can see that the p-value shows a significant you know, number. And remember, whenever the p-value is less than 5%, it means that there is a significant relationship. There's a significant difference. And the p-value is almost 0%. Okay? So it shows that there is a significant difference between the MPG for automatic cars and then the MPG for manual cars. That's what it means, okay? The MPG for automatic, which is a zero, and the MPG for manual. Now, when you look at the MPG for zero, it is 17, watch down here. Okay. The MPG, the mean MPG is 17. And then for manual, the mean MPG is 24. So the manual group one is showing a mean MPG of 24. And the manual for automatic is showing a mean MPG of 17. And we have already indicated that there is a significant difference. So on the basis of this, okay, what are you going to say? You will say that one of them outperform the other in terms of miles per gallon. Martin. So, yes, so please. Um, sorry to just draw you back. Like you are using the mean and the median all the time. So it's a bit confusing. Um, no. You were, you say median at a point, you also mentioned the mean. So we don't know which. Okay. Me per se, I don't know which of them we are using now, please. All right. So in this in this analysis, which one do you think we are using? Looking at this whole result, which one are we using? Which one do you think we are using? We are using the mean. Okay, so let's stick with that. That's what we are using. Okay. That's what, and I'm mentioning those numbers. Maybe I'm saying things differently, but that is what we are using. So it's the mean for automatic cars is 17, the mean for the manual cars is 24. So it means that the, the manual cars are outperforming the automatic cars. That's what it means. Significantly, statistically significantly speaking, statistically significantly speaking, the manual cars, which is the one, are performing the, okay, because the mean manual car the mean MPG for manual cars is 24, and the mean MPG for automatic cars is 17. So we now have a statistical backing to whatever we want to say. There's a statistical support to everything that we've done. So that is what you have there. Okay. This is a this second command is just a one tail. Yes, Azu. Your question. Hello. Hello. Azu. Hello. Why did it take that yeah. I'm saying that I was thinking that one represents uh, what do you call it? The automatic and then zero the manual. And what did you see? I just showed you what we saw. 
Not what you are thinking, it's what you are seeing. And based on the data, the initial data you gave us. Yes, but what do you see? What we are seeing, okay? What we are seeing here, it appears that that is how it's supposed to be. So don't worry much about which one is which. The most important thing is that, okay, if you look at this variable, just watch here. If you look at this, if you look at what we have here, one is manual, zero is automatic. So maybe there's been a, a bit of a switch, but don't let that bother you a lot, okay? Because if I try to use what is actually there, it might confuse you. So use, let's use what is in the slide. All right. You can use a one tail test and that one tail test will lead to this. All right, I want us to do another one. This time, not too sample, but we are gonna do something else. So look, take the data I gave you. And I'm gonna show you that data on your screen. This is the data I gave you earlier. This data, let's get a bit of description about the data. You have the ID, you have the female, which is gender, you have the race, you have the socioeconomic status, S, E, S, you have the school type, the program, the read score, the writing score, the mathematics score, the science score, and the social study score of several different people. Who are the people? Well, the data is for HSB2. It is the high school and beyond. Students from high school and beyond, A-level and so forth. It contains 200 students from high school with demographic information about their gender, which is a female, race, socioeconomic status, type of the school they attended, the program type, all of which are dummy variables. Everything is a dummy variable. Okay? So when we say dummy variables, gender is made up of zero or one is a dummy variable. Race, if you look at the data set carefully, okay, and you look at race, you can see that there are about four different kinds of races. You have one, you have, um, you have three, okay, you have two, you have four, and all of that. The SE is the socioeconomic status to we have one, you have two, you have three. So these are anytime you are represented with zero, one, two, three, and they are all dummy variables. So which ones are numeric? Which ones are not dummy, but they are rather numerical? Well, the numerical data are the test scores, the reading, the writing, the mathematics, the social studies. Those are the test scores. Now we're going to work with this data. We're going to work with this data. So all of you have the data already. We can load the data directly from the internet, or we can have the data and use the clipboard command to bring the data into. So this is what I want us to do. Let me see whether the data, I can get it in um, online. Let me see whether it's already in the memory of R. If it is in the memory of R, we'll do it. If it's not in the memory of R, okay, we will not do it. The data is not in the memory of R, let's try to get it. And that's why you have the Excel. So let's go to the Excel and let's load the data. Watch me as I go through it with you. How do you bring the data from Excel here? And take it? All you do is I click anywhere and do Control A to highlight the data. Control A to highlight the data. Once you do control C to copy, you see a diamond glass around the data set, going around the data set, okay? a diamond kind of ring. Then that means the data is copied in the memory of R, in the memory of the CASA, the clipboard. Now go to your R, okay, go to your R, and when you get to R, type the name of the data, HSB2, which is what I'm doing here. HSB2 at my number 23 commands here. Okay. And do equal to, type HSB2 equal to, okay. read dot the length into brackets. Read dot the length into brackets. 
the bracket, bring the double apostrophe. Double apostrophe. And then type clipboard. clipboard. That's it. Once you do that, run it. Or do control enter. Run it. Or do control enter. What has happened is that the data has been loaded automatically into my app. Because remember, I copied it already. How do I know that the data has been straight away loaded? David, you have a question? And not a question. Uh, could you kindly go over that particular command again, please? Okay. So this is what you do. You go to your data set, control A to highlight it, control C to copy. Job done in the Excel. Now you go to your R. And when you get to R, just type. Don't paste anything. Just type. And the name we want to give to the data is HSB2. So you type HSB2 equal to read dot the limb and bracket. Inside a bracket, bring a double apostrophe. And inside that double apostrophe, type clipboard. Once you are done with that, you run that. We run that, please go and click run or do control enter. And that will load the data from Excel to R. And the name we give to the data is HSB2. Now the read.delim command, what it's doing is that it is collecting, it is taking anything that is on the clipboard. The clipboard is a cursor. And remember that you've copied everything already onto the cursor. So when you brought it into R, it's already on the cursor. You don't see it is invisible, but then R will detect that from the clipboard, which is a cursor, and will put it into the memory. So now that you have now put the thing into the memory of R, the question we need to do is to go and check whether it is in R. How do you do that? Just highlight the HSB2, all smaller thing. Just highlight it, just like I've done now. HSB2 alone and do control enter. Once you do that, you see the data now showing down there in the console. Everything that you had has now been brought into the memory. That's how you load the data. And now you have seen clearly that the data is showing itself. Okay. So the data is in the memory. Okay. So we can proceed now to work on this data. Going to do well, we are going to do a certain test, and again, that is the same t test. We're going to do a t test. Okay, t test now. Before we can do the t test, we want to attach the data. Yes, David. Yes, please. Is it can I also? Yes, is it possible for me to because what I did was to uh, actually uh, load the upload the data. Uh, from Ask Excel. me your question. Tell uh, me your question. Yes. Uh, aside this uh, particular way of uploading, if you data, have any other way, do it. Yes. Any other way that okay. is good for you, it's okay. Okay. When right. students ask questions like this, I know that they have another way. Okay. If you have another way, do it. Don't worry. Grace, your question. All right. Please, I didn't hear what you said after. Um, popping into the clipboard. I didn't hear what you said next. I also don't remember what I said. <laughs> if you have a question, you ask rather. But I don't monitor what I've been saying. Um, if you want to check if the data is there, that is what I want to know. All right, okay. Highlight. All right, let's move on. So the next thing you want to do is to attach this data using the attach command and attach it into the memory of R. That's what you want to do. Attach the data into R's memory. Do that. How do you do that? Just go and type and run that. Okay. So you go into the memory of R. Okay. Just type attach into bracket HS. 
it will show beautifully down there blue in the console down there, which means that the data has been attached. So in this case, anytime you are writing command for this data, you don't have to write. So now let's go and do a T test. The same T test we did for right female. Now what this is going to do is this. Remember female is a dummy variable. It's a categorical variable. So we want to check the writing score for gender. Remember gender was represented as female. We want to write it. Writing score for gender. Writing score for gender. And, and, and actually, the question is that the writing score for gender, if you look at it, okay, it is 0, 01, 0, 01, 0, 01, 0, 01, 0, 01. Okay. And you have female. So female, female is written. Let me show you. Okay. Female is written first. Okay, so look at the data set. Female is written at the top, okay, which is what I'm showing. So once that female is written first, what it means is that that is the number one. So wherever you see one, it's for female. Wherever you see zero, it's for male. So we want to see whether females outperformed male when it comes to writing score. Okay. And you can see the writing score at the end there, at the top of the, the right. So we want to check whether females outperform the male or the males outperform the female. And then by, by doing a t-test, we are assuming that the data is normally distributed. Now, so we are already assuming that the data is normally distributed. I'm not going to check the normality of the data again and again and again. Okay? You can check it. Okay? Should we check? Should we check the normality of the data? Yes. Yeah. I knew you would say it. So let's check it. <laughs> okay. Let's check it, please. Let's do Shapiro dot test into bracket right. Okay. Shapiro dot test into bracket right and run it. There you go. At the bottom, you will see the results. And the results is clearly showing a p-value of What do you call it? Zero. Basically zero. Okay. That's what it's showing, a p-value of zero. So that means that the data is not normally distributed okay, by virtue of our normality. Now, this is not that much surprising because scores are kind of, I told you that they are more or less always in percentages. Okay, scores are always in percentages. And that is a typical example of non-parametric data. So what happens when you use uh, the t-test for it, even though the data is not normally distributed? I'll come back to that later. Okay. I'll come back. But this p-value, oh, by the way, this value, it simply means that there are seven zeros before nine, six, nine, eight, six. That's what it means. It means that there are seven zeros. Okay. Let me just write, here. yes, Martin, you have a question. So, once again, uh, sorry to drag you back again. Um, from the information I picked from uh, the platform, that is, in terms of uh, the 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 data from the was in Excel, my the data there is a bit different from what you are using on uh, for us today. So I'm a bit confused. Though I have done what you have said is different, so I'm also surprised that you are saying it's different. And because my own is about now in the layers, and I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, you no, no, you are using a different sheet. Please go and check the data. There's a sheet called data, not layers. There's okay. a sheet called data. So once again, okay. you're using a different sheet. Okay, thank you. All right, okay. So you have 9.8. E minus zero seven. That was the information you had. And what this means is that there are seven zeros, zero point zero 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 zero. Okay, nine eight. Anytime you see some of those things, okay, with minus e to the minus power zero seven, it means there are seven zeros 
before the nine eight six. If it is eleven, e to the power, it means the eleven zeros. You know, before that. So just note that. So that means that it's purely zero. So we are still going to go ahead and use the t test to do analysis. Okay, by typing this command. T test right with a tilde sign and then female. We want to check whether females are performing the males. Okay, so let's do that. And I'm going to go to do that in the R. So let's go to R here and just type T dot blah, 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 blah. Right tilde female and then run it. Run it. Now, when you run it, Again, you check here. These are the things you've been recording. At the bottom, also, you see that you have a T statistic of negative 3.66, a degrees of freedom of 169.71, with a P value of zero. So, with a P value of zero, what it means is that you should reject the null hypothesis of no difference. That's what I mean. We are rejecting the null hypothesis of no difference and concluding that a significant difference exists between males and females as far as writing score is concerned. A significant difference exists between males and females. Okay. Now, if a significant difference exists, then you should tell us which one is doing well. We said that the females are having a group number of one and the, fee, the, the males are having a zero. So you can see that group zero, their mean is 50. And group one, which is a female, their mean is approximately 55. So you can see that the females are having more right mean score than the males. So the conclusion would be females outperform the males when it comes to writing score. Immanuel. Yeah. Um, so um, I just want to check my understanding of where we are so far. So in this case, our hypothesis is the performance of the female in relation to the white score, to the right score. And we are, since the data is normally distributed, we are doing a t-test to confirm or disprove the hypothesis. Are you making a statement or you're asking a question? So, so I'm asking a question. Like it seems, I'm it seems I'm now connecting the dots now. So I want to make sure I'm on the right path. So with the data that we have, well, don't our... don't check whether you're on the right path because then everybody will check. Just ask me. Okay. Give you a okay, sir. So. Okay. Yeah, okay. So please. Idea. Yes, of please. Thank you very much. Happening now. We are doing here. Okay. okay, sir. Thank you. All right. So let me just wipe off this and give you an idea. You mentioned the word hypothesis, but you didn't check mention whether there's a null or alternative hypothesis. So in this case, the null hypothesis is trying to say that there is no difference. Okay, there is no difference in means. Okay, now the means I'm using mu, so I'll use mu one is not equal to mu two. Okay. Well, in this case, I'm representing the mean for the female. Oh, sorry, it's supposed to be equal to. So you write mu is equal to, mu one is equal to mu two. So it shows that there's no difference, which means that the mu for the female minus the mu for the male is equal to zero. That's another way of writing it. Because if I move this one to the other side, that would be, this is a mean. This is a null hypothesis. Now the alternative hypothesis, okay, is that there is a difference. Okay, so which means that the mu one is not equal to the mu two. That's what okay. 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 So the means are different. That's the first right. one. Sorry, the first one is say the means are the same. Okay. And the second one is the right. means are different. So the first one is indicating same means. That's why the difference is zero. The second one is saying that different means. Okay. Now, if p value is less than 5%, okay? If p value is less than 5%, you are rejecting this null hypothesis. Okay. That's what you're doing. All right. 
if mean value is that we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, so the most important thing is to check the mean values when you do the test. And so you go to the test section here, you do a test, okay, and then you now identify the T statistic and finally the p-value. The okay. p-value are less than 5%. To be precise, the p-value is equal to zero, if you look at the last one. And whenever the p-value is less than 5%, you reject the null hypothesis, which says that the differences are the same, the means are the same. Now, we are rejecting that, which means that we are concluding that the means are not the same. Okay, sir. Okay. And you can see clearly that the means are not the same. One is 55 at the bottom there for the female, and one is 50 for the male. Mm -hmm. So the, the females got more writing score by 5%. Or five percent more writing score than the female, the males. So the females are outperforming the males in terms of writing score. A difference is why it's statistically significant. Okay. Statistically speaking, now the only reason why we are agreeing that there's a big difference is because the p-value says so. The p-value, in fact, the p-value said we made no mistake. The actual mistake is zero. If you check it. But you can also have a situation where the gap between the first group and the second group is still a gap of five, and yet you will not reject the null hypothesis. So we are rejecting the null hypothesis. We are rejecting the null that says there's this, the same, the means are the same. We are rejecting it because the p-value says we should reject it. Okay, sir. Yeah. And, and Thank you very much. And this is, you'll be doing so many of them. So the intricacies, you don't need to know much. The key point you need to know is what are you doing? I want to know whether there's a significant difference between these groups. And once the p-value says it's less than 5%, then it means that there's a significant difference. If the p-value says, if the p-value is more than 5%, then there is no significant difference. That's it. Some people have right. questions. Um, others have answered them. So I think they sorted. So if you're having challenge, you ask in the group, somebody will answer you right there. So let me show you the final results that we had for this. So this is the final results that we had. You can see it's exactly what we just spoke about right now. When you are doing these things by yourself, it helps you to know what's happening. Now, remember we attached when we're doing our R, we did an attachment. Okay, let me just go back. Look at the commands here. We did an attach of the data set. It's always good to detach before you exit to that particular data. So go type detach. And the key should be one this time. Detach. And then run that. So that means that you have removed the information from it. Next time you want to use it, go and attach it again and then use it. All right, let's take another example. Because examples are perfect. They will help you get a picture. So this is a conclusion. The results indicate that there is a significant difference between the mean writing score for females and that of males. In other words, females have a statistically significantly higher mean score on writing, which is the value here. In short, females Generally speaking, outsmart males when it comes to writing. See how you will write it in a, a journal or a thesis. This is exactly how to put it in a, a journal or a thesis. You see, that last sentence is very important. That last sentence shows you understand, practically speaking, what you have indicated. That is important. That last sentence. You understand that it means that the females are outsmarting the males when it comes to writing. And it's important to say when it comes to writing, it's not to say that females are, are smarter than males. No, when it comes to writing, because when you go to mass or social studies or science, things might change. Let's take another example. 
Now, in this example, there's another two test example, independent. Okay, so I Again, using the box plus to do all of that, you can check it. Checking for normality first before you can do that. Okay. Independent. All of these are examples. Now let's go to dependent. Dependent. Where the samples, the subjects are the same. Okay. Someone says I, may, I was able to write all the tests. <laughs> you didn't. Go check typos and you notice that. Okay. Go check typos and you notice that you made some couple of typos and that maybe you do not even load the data well. Okay. So some of, most of these things are typos and typos can deal with it. So dependent samples are those samples that are, that are matched, paired. Remember that you know, data should be normal, normally distributed okay, for the t-test to be used. So we are going to look at a situation where we have the dilemma of two graders. And this is a storyline. To promote fairness, each application was graded twice by different examiners. So two different examination lecturers have been told to mark the same paper. Based on the grades below, is there a difference between the two graders? It's like a whole group of students are angry at one lecture. And so they complain, and then the works, the, the, the students' work have been given to another lecturer. And those are the grades that you see here. Those are the grades. Now you have grader one and grader two. Grader one and grader two. You can do a box plot of grader one and grader two to see whether there's a difference. And this is a box plot, okay? Sorry, you can do that on your own. Let me do that in, in R for you. You can follow me. You don't have to because of time. We don't have to do all of that. Okay. You can just be following me. Whilst I, I pick the information. Into R. So this is the information into R. I just type the first information into R for grade one. I'm typing the second information into R. I just did that for grade two. And then I use a box plot to represent the results. Okay. And the box plot, I'm coloring it as yellow. So it appears that there's some slight challenge. It says grader one is not found. So it appears I didn't run grader one. Let me see. So you get grader one, grader two, and then the box plot. That's what you see on the right with the box plot. Again, when you look at the box plot, it appears that there seems to be some differences. But let's go ahead this time. And then, you know, and again, we are assuming that this data is normally distributed. Take note. We can check for the normality of the data, but, you know, we don't want to bore ourselves much. Okay. When you want to check the normality of the data, what it simply means is that you put all of them together and check the normality. We don't want to bore ourselves with that. So let's go straight to do the test, assuming that it is uh, normally distributed. And because the data are the same, because it's the same grader, one is grading the scores, okay? And then grader two is also grading the same student. So the students themselves are the same students. And so the test we are going to use is t-test. But watch, we didn't just say t-test, okay? Um, MPG automatic manual or something. We just added paired. That's the main difference. Paired equals to true. Paired is true, which means that the data is paired. When the data is paired, what it means is that it is dependent. Paired. Paired. Matched. Matched. Okay. That means the data is dependent. Do that, and this is a result. Check down here the result. And you see the p value. The p value is almost zero, okay. which shows that there is a significant difference in the scores. Okay. There's a significant difference in the scores. Now, watch it carefully. P value here means that okay, we agree that a significant difference exists in the grading. 
That's what it means. A significant difference exists in the gradient. So, so you can see that whatever it is, the, if you later check the mean, it will give you an idea. If you go and use an independent, this is a dependent test. If you go and use an independent test, let me just tell you something. I'm going to do an independent test for this. So I'll type something like T. I'll just type the same thing. T, test, greater one, greater two. Instead of paired, I'll say false. Let me just type false. And you can see that that one, because watch the two differences. Okay, watch the differences. You see that the first one is a Welsh two sample. The, the paired is a T pair T test. And then the other one is a Welsh two sample. Okay. Now, in both cases, you have a P value. If you look at it, if you assume that the data is independent, you can see clearly that the P value shows there is no significant difference. That is, if you assume that they are separate, it's not the same person, they are different, different people. Okay. So the score of three, the score of two, the score of zero, the score of one, they are for different, different people. Then what's going to happen is that it means that independent, it means that um, there, is, there, is, there is no significant difference. And how do you know that there's, even though look at the mean, the mean for both of them, one is 3.8 and the other is 2.8. There is no difference. If you assume that is independent sample. But if you assume that is dependent sample, if you assume that is dependent sample, if you assume that it is a paired sample, then there is a difference. Okay, then there is a difference. Then you can see that the, the difference is not zero. Okay, the difference is not the same. Then there's a significant difference between the. So the, what is important there is to go sit down and analyze these things and master the difference between dependent and independent sample. Now let me show you the results here. Yes, friends. So uh, in each of the cases, the earlier one, the results we performed concerning the pair T test, you could see that the mean wasn't calculated for each. But if you come to the uh, the independent, you could see that the yes. mean was calculated. So I want to find out why is it that the mean wasn't calculated for the paired? Okay, very good. The reason why the mean is not calculated for the paired is because the subject is the same. So it's the same person. So they don't want to, again, you know, make it look like, you know, it's a, it's a separate thing. Okay. So they don't need to compute that mean to confuse anybody. But in the independent sample, these are different subjects, different, you know, individuals. And so that is why we need to sound separate. But that's a very good observation because it just shows that you are really, really following the, the mean, the mean calculations. Thank you, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, so you've just done two samples. You've not even gone to three samples and all of that, and somebody is dying already. Okay, don't die. Now, if, and this is important, if the data is, 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 is not normally distributed, then the test you are going to use, these two tests you're going to use, is the Man Whitney U test, MW. You. If the idea is that this is a rank data, this is a skew data, this data has outliers, okay, then you are not going to be dealing with means, you're going to be dealing with medians. And in that case, the test you're going to be doing is known as man Whitney u test. Look, these things can happen a lot when you're dealing with some data. Let's say that you begin to collect the scores of some NDC scores and MPP scores, and you want to check these scores. The scores are only rated in 100%. You believe that this information is not normally distributed. There are some skewness and all outliers. And so you have to go and use Man Whitney U test to do that. Okay. Especially if you are doing scores. I keep using the word scores a lot. Then you have to use the Man Whitney U test. I have a typical example here. Okay. And this is a typical example. This is information. Placebo drag. You can type this thing, you know, I'm going to do it here for you. But please notice all of these are two samples. I'm going to assume here that the data is not normally distributed. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to just type this data into Excel. I go to R, 
And then I type this data. Now, let's enter into the memory of R, and this is the data here. Placebo has been typed, and then I do the same thing for the new drug. Please, Benjamin, for your information, this, this information that you're having here is just an information where somebody has created a new drug. The person believes that anybody who has dyspnea, which is asthmatic condition, anybody with such problem, if the person takes a new drug, the person will be better. So you want to more or less check the effectiveness of the new drug. That's all. That's all. Okay. And so you decide to check the effectiveness of the new drug. The first thing you want to do is to check whether the data is normally distributed. So let's first do a check. And please, the data normality, you type it like this. Watch it. You type Shapiro.test into bracket placebo. And then the other one, you do the same thing, that Shapiro.test into bracket, you know, new drug. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to run both of them to see whether they are both normally distributed. Check at the bottom. You see that the p-value for the first one is 25. You see that the p-value for the second one is what? Is 93. Normally distributed or they are not? Are they normally distributed or they are not? Yes, Prince. So I think they are normally distributed. Good, they are. Okay. Now that you've established that they are normally distributed, sometimes you have to just stop whatever you are doing and follow me. Then later on, you take your time and do it. But if you are really, really going to go with me in everything, you get lost, okay? Sometimes you just have to follow. Okay. Now that you have realized that they are all normally distributed, it means that, okay, we should not use, ideally, we should not use the man Whitney because man Whitney is for non-normally distributed data. And so, uh, we should not use. In fact, I did a box plot. Let me show you something. The box plots here for both of them, it appears that they are a bit close to each other, and it also appears that there's a bit of difference. But whatever it is, now we are going to do the now. Let me show you how we do the manuity test for this. So this is the manuity test. You just type Will Cox. Uh -uh. You just type Wilcox test. Okay. I'm just going to type that here. You have to just follow me. Wilcox. This is for non parametric. Wilcox test placebo new drug and just run it. Okay. Now look at the result. The result is what? Okay. P value is almost 6%. P value is six percent. What that means is that you know we cannot reject the null hypothesis. We cannot reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says there is no difference. There is no difference. Okay, our p values are our mistakes are too much, so we just have to dance to the tune of the null hypothesis, and that is how you conclude. This is partly because the data was what was normally distributed. And they went ahead to use that thing. On the surface, let me just share something with you, okay? Because you need to see this. On the surface, the data suggests a difference. But the sample size is small, so we couldn't get a difference. Now let me share something with you. Let's try and do the same thing, this time using, um, what do you call it? Um, what do you call it? A parametric test instead of a non parametric test that we used. The parametric equivalent is the t test. The t test that was showing a paired t test. Okay. Not the one without. I'm going to just run the t test at the bottom. 
look down here, look up here. Okay, T test, and I'm going to do placebo. I'm just going to copy this placebo and then new drug here. And then just do it for this data, assuming it is paired. Remember that the sample size is small though. And watch it. Again, the p-value is showing that there is um, no difference. Just like the other one indicated. Okay. In fact, this one, you are being punished even more. And the reason why you are being punished even more is because the sample size is five in each case, or 10 in both cases. Sample size is five in each case, okay. and you are using a parametric test. That's not healthy. Okay. So again, this one is also punishing that. You can't use a parametric test when the sample size is not more than 30. The sample size must be more than 30 you know, when using a parametric test, because parametric test requires a larger sample in both cases. And that is why you can see that the parametric test, even the non-parametric test was better. Okay. The Wilcoxon was better because the p-value was close to 5%. But this one is way above 15%. So again, it shows that it's better to, to ensure that you have a larger sample all the time whenever you are doing such things. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue next time by looking at non- um, Three sample tests, three sample tests. Okay. Next time, that's what we're gonna do. Three sample tests, okay. We'll analyze that and then we'll go and then see. For the rest of the information that you have, try as much as possible to prepare for them. The ones that I couldn't cover, just try and prepare for them. It will help you a lot. But next time we're gonna do non-parametric. Both parametric and non-parametric, but in a three sample. Or more means we are dealing with ANOVA, both dependent and independent, Friedman, okay, and then Chris Kawales. Now, ANOVA is a parametric test. Friedman and Chris, Chris Kawales test are non parametric, and we are going to do all of them because they deal with three or more. Three or more. What a day is being, what a day.